Good afternoon. I'm Cheryl Ziegler, Director of the ULCC Library and Archives. On behalf of our hosts, the ULCC Library Committee, Literary Subcommittee, Archives Subcommittee, and the Caxton Club, welcome to today's program with Dr. Brian McCammack and Dr. Courtney Pierre Jacobs. Um, Joseph, I'm sorry, discussing Landscapes of Hope, Nature and the Great Migration in Chicago. I would like to extend a special welcome to our Caxton Club friends who are attending this program. If you are not a Union League Club member, I hope you'll consider membership in our club community, one that values civic, culture, and social engagement. For more information, visit www.ulcc.org or connect Contact, contact membership at ulcc.org. A huge thank you to Caxton Club President Jackie Bosler for collaborating with us on our virtual programming. By working together, we can extend our reach and bring you more and varied programming. We truly are better together. We encourage you to purchase your books from local independent bookstores. Dr. McCammick's book is available through Semicolon Bookstore and Gallery. Dr. McCammock and Dr. Joseph will be happy to answer questions, so please put them in the Q&A anytime during the program, and they'll be addressed after their presentation. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers for today. Dr. Brian McCammock is Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Chair of American Studies at Lake Forest College. He is author of Landscapes of Hope, Nature and the Great Migration in Chicago, published by Harvard University Press in 2017. It won the Organization of American Historians Frederick Jackson Turner Award for Best First Scholarly Book in American History and the American Society for Environmental History's George Perkins Marsh Prize for Best Book in Environmental History. Dr. McCammick's current book project examines the modern environmental movement's failure to build a robust interracial coalition in the 1970s. Dr. Courtney Pierre Joseph is an assistant professor of history and African-American studies at Lake Forest College. Her specializations are in African-American history and culture, Haiti and its diaspora, women, women and gender studies and hip hop culture. Dr. Joseph earned her PhD in history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 2017. She has spoken at numerous institutions, including the DuSable Museum of African American History and at various events, including the Fall 2020 Chicago Humanities Festival. Dr. Joseph is currently working on her first book tentatively titled DuSable's Diaspora, Haiti, Blackness and Belonging in Chicago. I'm so very happy to have you both. Welcome to you both. Um, I'll now step back and turn the program over to you. Well, my thanks for that very kind introduction, Cheryl. Uh, and thanks to the ULCC and the Caxton Club uh, and to Professor Joseph. It's a real treat to be able to be in conversation with her because we don't see each other anymore. In this past year of the pandemic, you know, we'd be on campus and see each other regularly not so much the past year. So this is a real treat to talk about how our work uh, intersects. Um, so we're hoping to have sort of a free flowing discussion between the two of us today and entertain your questions. Uh, but I thought I would start out by talking about the genesis of my book, Landscapes of Hope. Uh, and the idea was really to uh, unpack how and why nature mattered to African-Americans in Chicago in the interwar period. Um, and that motivation was really driven by a lot of scholarship that has been written about Black Chicago, tons of scholarship. Probably there's no one city in this country that has been written more about when it comes to the African-American community than Chicago. And a lot of that has to do with the Chicago School of Sociology uh, at the University of Chicago. But so much has been written and to the extent that it was written about African-Americans in the environment, it primarily took an environmental justice or environmental injustice perspective, very rightly pointing out the ways in which African-Americans were disproportionately subject to a whole host of environmental ills, pollution, 
um, lack of access to green space. And that literature is, is really, really robust and has told us a lot about environmental inequalities. But it tended, in my view at least, to obscure how and why nature mattered to African Americans in the first place. Like what, what was lost by virtue of all of those environmental inequalities, all of those barriers that were set up preventing African Americans from enjoying Chicago's lakefront, from enjoying Chicago's park system, from enjoying outlying areas that I write about in my book. We're not gonna talk about um, you know, African American resorts and experiences in the forest preserves in Cook County, all those kinds of things. That's like half of, of landscapes of hope. Um, we're gonna focus on the city environments, but thinking about how and why nature mattered to African Americans, ten that tended to get obscured in the scholarship, right? And I think something really profound is lost if we just focus on the, the indignities, the inequalities, that is, that is central to the story that I tell too, but how did African Americans actually think about the environment? Why did it matter to African Americans in the 19 teens and 20s and 30s that they couldn't go to the same beaches that white Chicagoans could without risking racial violence, right? What was lost there? So that's, that's the, the essence of uh, the, the book, really exploring the various places in and around Chicago where African Americans sought out nature. Um, and to know, to, to understand that, we need to talk a little bit about the Great Migration. Um, the, the Great Migration absolutely transforms Chicago, transforms cities across the North and West, really throughout the entirety of the 20th century. The period that I write about in the book really looks at the first wave of African American migration, first substantial wave. There were African Americans in Chicago, as Professor Joseph will tell you from the very beginning. Um, but this first massive wave of migration of African Americans from the South happens in the 19 teens. It's a response to push factors in the South. This is what migration historians call push factors and pull factors. What's pushing you out of a place, what's pulling you to a different place. Those push factors in the South are, are things that we, we all know, I think, from our, our history classes, whether in, you know, all the way back to elementary school, up to high school and in college. Jim Crow, disfranchisement, lynching, racial violence, all of these factors, a lack of economic opportunity, educational opportunity in the South, pushing African-Americans out of the South in the hopes of finding a land of hope in the North, right? Many African-American migrants before coming to Chicago viewed Chicago as the land of hope, right? Some place where you could realize those dreams that were denied you in the South. Part of that story has to do with nature and the environment. So. A lot of what Landscapes of Hope does is trace the various ways in which a lot of those hopes were, were dashed in the North by uh, racial segregation, redlining, restrictive covenants, all of these uh, discriminatory policies that tend to result in segregation and continued economic inequality in African-American neighborhoods in places like Chicago. So, the Great Migration really uh, grows the African-American population dramatically over the course of the 19 teens, 20s, and 30s. Roughly 45,000 is the African-American population in 1910. By the time you get to the 1940 census, that is more than sextupled to about 250,000, quarter of a million, a little bit more than that actually, about 275. And then by the time you get to 1970, an even more massive wave of migration in the 1940s and 50s has quadrupled that population size. And also, this is really crucial, quadrupled the share of the population of the city of Chicago. So in 1940, when African-Americans uh, number about 275,000, they're about 8% of the population. By 1970, the, the, the raw number has quadrupled to a million, give or take, but the share of the population has also quadrupled to about 32, 33% by 1970. So there's a whole story built in there of white flight and suburbanization as migrants are flowing into the city. But my book focuses more on that first wave of migration. And I wanted to start out by showing uh, this map, which I, I joked as we were preparing today, I compulsively show in, in all of these presentations that I've done of, about the book over the years, because I think it, what's it's that, Professor Joseph? It's an important map. It's a really important map visual. Can you, I, I've been talking so much. Can you tell us about why it's so important? 
Um, I mean, the understanding of segregation, I think it shows that um, people think about Chicago as an incredibly segregated city as well, despite having, you know, these bustling kind of ethnic enclaves and, um, you know, the Black Belt being one of them, but understanding that these are not random things, that people are not just all deciding to live in the same areas, which part of that is true, right? But there's a other aspect of it with some of the things you're talking or mentioned, you know, racial covenants. Um, and then there's an intense amount of just racial violence happening on the streets that polices these boundaries um, on an everyday level that helps us to understand why the black belt looks the way that it does. Why it looks the way it does and where it is, exactly. right? I mean, so racially restrictive covenants are rampant in Chicago in the 19 teens and 20s, eventually struck down in the 1940s, but replaced by the effects of redlining, which come up, comes about in the 1930s. And that's why we're talking about Chicago's South Side, fully acknowledging that there is a, a robust and growing and vibrant West Side African American community. But my book is, is focused on the South Side. Um, and, and why are we talking about the South and West Sides and not the North Side? Because of these discriminatory policies that tended to shunt African Americans into particular neighborhoods, into particular sections of the city, and preclude settlement in other parts of the city. And so much of that is built into this map. So this is a map from uh, 1945, uh, Horace Caton and Sinclair Drake and their famous voluminous sociological study of Chicago. A lot of their data was collected in the 1930s, but you can see the expansion of African-American neighborhoods in this map, right? The, the darkest shaded area was the extent of African-American neighborhoods on the south side in 1920, expanding further south, further east by 1930. And this area right here, bound by racially restrictive covenants, not settled uh, by African-Americans until that 1940-41 as a direct result of the Hansberry versus Lee Supreme Court case, when Carl Hansberry, the father of the playwright Lorraine Hansberry, intentionally buys a house in this neighborhood that had been bound by racially restrictive covenants, legally denying African-Americans the right to settle there. He buys a house there, fights it all the way up to the Supreme Court and wins sort of on a technicality, um, but wins and almost overnight that neighborhood turns from exclusively white to exclusively African-American. So you might be thinking to yourself like, well, they haven't talked about nature and the environment yet. What's up with that? Uh, well, people tend to recreate close to where they live. So I think if you want to understand how nature mattered to black Chicagoans in this period, you have to understand the patterns of racial segregation and why we talk about Washington Park as a crucial area for African Americans building community, particularly uh, by the time we get to about the 1930s and 1940s, it's because we have African American neighborhoods, heavily segregated African American neighborhoods immediately to the North, West and South of a place like Washington Park. And it also helps explain that the, the places in which African-Americans tend to seek out the lakefront, right? We've got marked up here that history of racial violence in the city that Professor Joseph talked about. Uh, the 1919 riot begins at 29th Street Beach when a 17-year-old Eugene Williams is struck in the head uh, with a, a brick or a rock thrown by a white man. He dies, he drowns in Lake Michigan and uh, a week plus of racial violence is touched off in the city. That's a conflict over access to environmental goods, right? Eugene Williams ostensibly floated too far south into what was a white section of that beach and he paid for it with his life, right? All these other dots also speak to that history of racial violence, right? Bombings between 1917 and 1921 were carried out by whites, white Chicagoans who did not want African-Americans settling in what had historically been a white neighborhood. Um, so that's why we're talking about places like Washington Park, about the lakefront on the south side from roughly, you know, you can think about like Soldier Field, Roosevelt Road, south um, to at this point in history, roughly Jackson Park, although, you know, as history moves on, we're talking about Rainbow Beach uh, further south of Jackson Park as well. Um, Professor Joseph, do you want to chime in here with some thoughts? Sure. I feel like I'm monologuing. I don't want to. No, do no, that. no. This is good. I think um, it's a nice setup to, and I always 
floored by how much information Professor Prohamic just has. You know, it's just lovely to talk to a fellow historian thinking about Chicago um, in this very real way. My work is involved in that and then looks at it from a longer historical perspective. So um, I come at thinking about the Chicago landscape by thinking in Blackness in the Chicago landscape as being one in the same. Um, if we think about the oral traditions um, and the oral history around Chicago's first settlement, we're talking about a man of African descent from the island of Saint-Domingue, now known as Haiti. Um, in the years that Haiti is even becoming its first, you know, this first Black Republic, Chicago is being first settled. Um, I never use the term founded because it was already a space for indigenous people, especially Potawatomi in the area at the time that he then comes and collaborates with to form this first really important settlement using the nature of Chicago in a way to launch this really successful business. Right. And so even that settlement was the first farm that had produce that fed everybody in the Chicagoland area in the late 1700s. And so to think about how then Black people then have to fight for access to the nature's landscape speaks to what happens and how um, the Great Migration becomes a time for new migrants, new Black migrants in the city to look back at the DuSable story and say, well, this is space that he helps to, you know, settle and, and lives in and is a multicultural space with this Black man as the, the father of Chicago. That then gives us access, access to the space as well. And so we first see that um, at the 1933 World's Fair um, where, Share my screen. So the 1933 World's Fair is the first place that we see um, new African Americans and in particular women who are teachers and librarians living in the South Side of, of Chicago as uh, Professor McCambick was talking about this burgeoning black belt is happening. More and more African Americans are moving to the area and they're looking for educational tools and again, something to historicize themselves and claim space. And at the 1933 World's Fair, which is supposed to celebrate Chicago, right? And it's, it's establishment in city. What does the city, what is the history of the city? What are we celebrating? And it's black women in particular, um, like Annie Oliver, who is on the left hand of the screen, who is the leader and founder, one of the founders of the National DuSable Memorial Society, who say we have to, in a real way, think about Chicago as a place for and by Black people. And so in the midst, and I'm forgetting, um, Professor McCammick, you said which park was this replica in? Uh, it was in Burnham Park, right along the lakefront. So right along the lakefront, these women, after about you know several um, months of um, activism to even get DuSable remembered at the 1933's World Fair, they decide to then build a replica, a small replica of the cabin and the homestead where DuSable and his indigenous wife, Kitty Hawa lived, and then to then hand out pamphlets like these are the um, photographs of the pamphlets that they hand out which are the first like histories of Dusab that we see in the city and again attached to attached to that great migration moment where black people are trying to take ownership of the space and take ownership of, of some part lay claim to it um we then see how this moves forward into the latter half of the Great Migration that Professor uh, McCammick's talking about, as more and more Black people are moving into Chicago and populating and then bursting out the seams of what the Black Belt starts to look like. That's when you see markers of DuSab's name being important placeholders for Black people across the city, but more specifically on the South Side. So one of those would be the DuSable High School, which is still there today. Um, and it was a direct result of that 1933-34 um, World's Fair. It was just being built then, and Black people again lobbied to have it named after DuSab again because they're claiming space for themselves. 
largely again black women. The woman who is here on the right is Margaret Burroughs, who decides in the 1960s to rename the very first um, that she'd started the very first African American museum in Chicago, and it was the Ebony and Ivory. Um, or the Ebony, I'm sorry, Museum. I'm thinking of the song because that's a great song, by the way. Um, the Ebony Museum of African American History, but then comes into conflict with the name of the the magazine, Ebony Magazine, and to you know avoid confusion, she decides to rename it the Dusabo Museum of African American History. Again, showing in how black people during the great migration looked back at that history of Dusab as a black man and said, it's important for us as black Chicagoans to then see him honored in, in the actual landscape of the city. More recently though, this is um, what used to be the Michigan Avenue Bridge, which is now renamed the Dusabo Bridge that is right near where the only current bust um, for, for Dusabo is in the city, bought by a Haitian man in 2008 who um, migrated to Chicago. Again, my work thinks about even extending the great migration to include African and Caribbean people who continue to populate the city in the 70s all the way through today. And so while um, the great migration, most historians think about it as ending around 1970, my work looks at pushing it beyond then because that's when we see Jamaican, Haitian, et cetera, people more and more coming to Chicago and redefining what we think of as Black Chicago. And I argue that's a direct result, again, of this kind of multiracial, multi-ethnic Blackness that begins with Dusab, which we then see um, in this bus that is right overlooking um, the Chicago River in what is known as Pioneer Court. I think we'll spend probably, I'm gonna stop here um, and, and, and pass, pass the mic, any thoughts? My dear yeah, I, I can I can pick up on that and talk about uh, the DuSable Museum in Washington Park and and I, I think it's a great jumping off point too to think about the the World's Columbia Exposition in Chicago uh, in 1934 mid 1930s as an instance where African Americans in the city are claiming public space they're claiming access to what exists of nature in the city and primarily that's the lakefront and other Chicago parks. Um, so if we look at this map, I think it's it's great uh, and, and to see just how big, first of all, the 1934 fair was right along the lakefront. Uh, this over here on the left of frame is where Millennium Park is now, it used to be just a rail switching yard right downtown and they built uh, the, the Century of Progress fair here along Northerly Island, which was designed by Daniel Burnham, uh, was supposed to initially be uh, a series of islands stretching down the South Lake Shore, but they only got this first one built. So the planetarium's there, and if we zoom in, I can show you where the DeSable cabin is. Spelled a little differently, but where the DeSable cabin is on the map, right in the shadow of Fort Dearborn. Right? And Fort Dearborn is absolutely central to the story of Chicago's founding, the so-called Fort Dearborn Massacre in the 19th century. So I think it's really significant right, that the Sobel's cabin is right next to that as another founding story of the city that is being incorporated more than it has been to, to that point in, in history. And it is in such close proximity to where the 1919 riot began. So this is uh, if we look here, this is 31st Street. I zoomed in too far. Go back the other way. 31st Street here. Remember the riot started at 29th Street. So just a block or two further south is where Eugene Williams was murdered, fighting for access to the lakefront, right? Other African Americans fighting in his memory for access to park space, claiming that space. And here we are in the 1930s and the activists that Professor Joseph talked about have succeeded in sort of planting a flag there. That's so great to also bring up um, the proximity to Fort Dearborn and the Fort Dearborn massacre that happens, which is the indigenous um, groups in the area who, you know, fight back against what they see and are correct in seeing as encroachment on their land that will continue and continue to push them west and we hopefully know how that story is continuing today. But um, one of the only things that they did not burn down and during that uh, Fort Dearborn massacre was DuSable's cabin um, because he was recognized as a very um, critical person and friend um, to the indigenous people at the time. So they did not burn down um, his original homestead, which, 
actually, then John Kinsey, who is recognized as the father of Chicago, actually moved into. Um, so that's just a really interesting, interesting, um, you know, even spatially how then they're able to put that cabin right back um, in a very similar spot in retelling that history of which is more important. I was also going to mention the change in name. So the change in name, um, DuSable's name has been seen and rewritten, and this is a longer thing that my uh, my book is going to go into on why there's so many mis you know different spellings and how do we even know much about this um, this individual. Um, his name has been written in other people's things in so many various ways, but Desab, as they had it written there, was the correct, one of the uh, more accurate ones, that D-E-S-I-S-A-I-B-L-E. And yet, when they were going to name Dusabo High School, they were going to name it Desabo High School in the correct spelling, but um, there's discussions in the Chicago Defender about how they were nervous that it would be mispronounced to disabled or disable high school. And they didn't want that to become, you know, confusing. So that is why they then re the change the spelling that we see across the Chicago landscape as Dusab, which even speaks again to like Chicagoans needing to um, retell that story in a way that fits even, you know, their understanding and, and their culture that's, that's being formed in Chicago during the great migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, laying claim to those kinds of recreational spaces and the historical stories that are told about Chicago, uh, you're seeing more and more of that activism in the teens, 20s, and 30s. It's absolutely linked to the Great Migration and African Americans asserting their rights, right? Pushing back against all of those barriers that are being erected almost as fast as they can tear them down. New barriers are being erected in this period. Uh, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about one particular space. I've shown you a lot of uh, maps, uh, but I want to see, like, want you to see, like, what these spaces, some of these spaces, actually look like. This doesn't look like much, right? Pretty much an unimproved field. This is at roughly uh, 37th and Rhodes Avenue on the south side, so almost due west of the lakefront map that I showed you before. And this was turned into, I don't have very many great pictures of uh, Madden Park when it was fully realized, but I've got this great one of a, a model of it um, that somebody put together in the 1930s. Turn an unimproved lot into a community destination by the mid 1930s. This is right where the Ida B. Wells public housing project uh, is built and opens in the early 1940s. This becomes a community destination and a place for Chicagoans, African Americans in particular, to seek out a little bit of nature and a little bit of the kind of recreation that we think about in the Chicago park system, laying claim to that space. And uh, storied Chicago activists like Ida B. Wells, who was nearing the end of her career and the end of her life in the 1920s and 1930s, is absolutely central to uh, the building of Madden Park. Um, so the Chicagoans are laying uh, claim to spaces like that, sort of in the heart of the working class African American section of the city uh, in the 30s in Bronzeville, uh, right along uh, what is now MLK Boulevard. Um, and they, they're also staking claims to Washington Park. So I wanted to show uh, some aerial views of Washington Park to give you just a, if you haven't been there, just a sense of how expansive this place is. I mean, it's 371 acres. It was designed by Calvert uh, Vox and Frederick Law Olmsted in the 1870s, coming off their design of Central Park, well before there was any substantial African-American population in the city. Uh, and they designed it as an antithesis to the built up city environment. And, and when they designed it in the 1870s, this was like way out in the country. We're six miles south of the loop. There was nothing here. Uh, in their report, they say they're like, oh, there are like 12 houses on the entirety of the property for Washington Park and Jackson Park combined together at more than a thousand acres. But you can see by the 1930s, and then this photo is actually from the 1970s, that that kind of antithesis to the built up environment, especially the densely built environment of Chicago South Side, that's an important recreational amenity to find a, a little slice of nature, to find uh, some respite from the city for these African-American neighborhoods that are to the, uh, to the west and to the north here. So laying claim to spaces like that, this is just the top half of Washington Park. I'm gonna show you the bottom half of Washington Park here in a moment. 
and uh, point out the, the DuSable Museum that Professor jo Joseph was talking about uh, right here. It's a pretty big building, but it looks tiny right here on the east side of the park, uh, just a stone's throw away from the University of Chicago. Um, so African-Americans are laying claim to spaces like Washington Park. It has become a de facto African-American space by about 1930. Uh, places where you can have the Bud Billiken Parade and picnic, the, the culmination of the parade that starts at least originally and traditionally starts further north uh, ends in Washington Park with this picnic. You can see all of these people here coming together in August as sort of a back to school celebration with youth as the focus of Bud Billiken Day. It continues today, right? I mean, Barack Obama has been involved in the Bud Billiken Day Parade. Luminaries like Joe Lewis and Muhammad Ali went to the Bud Billiken Day Parade. So this is black space, right, by the 1930s and still today. Um, so it, it, it has the capacity at 371 acres to host these massive crowds like this and to be a conduit of protest. I mean, it's a, it's a hotbed of protests in the Depression when African Americans are being forced out of their homes, evicted in large numbers for failure to pay rent. People would organize in Washington Park, go out to the Black Belt and put literally put people's, people's possessions back in their homes. It was a center of protest in the 1960s and 1970s during the Black Power Movement. Um, and that kind of tradition continues today, right? If you, if you know Diet High School uh, on the north end of Washington Park, a hunger strike held uh, in Washington Park as a way to keep that school open uh, amid a rash of school closures um, in the last decade or so. So it can host these huge crowds. It's a center of activism, but it's also a place for scenes like this, right? Like this is Washington Park. This is in the middle of the city. This is what I really wanted to be the cover of my book. I so love this cute. picture so much. It's so cute. Um, so like, you know, fishing or pretending to fish, at least in a Washington Park lagoon. And you wouldn't know, right? If you're those kids, my daughter just turned four yesterday. Those kids must be like three or four, right? You wouldn't, you can lose yourself, right? You can be a kid and pretend that you're in nature. That's exactly what Olmsted and Vox wanted in the 1870s. And it's even more relevant to African-American migrants from the South, right? I want to caution uh, sort of the assumption, caution against the assumption that African-American migrants are coming from rural environments in the South. Some of them certainly did, but many of them had experience in major cities of the South, like Birmingham, which was booming with the steel mills, Atlanta, New Orleans, I mean, you name it, right? Experience in the cities before coming up, but even those major cities of the South were much more rural in character, much more spread out than Chicago. Like Chicago was something of an order of magnitude different from what migrants had experienced uh, in the South. Being able to maintain those close connections to nature that was a little bit easier in the South, translate them to the North, places like Washington Park, places like the lakefront, and then further out in the forest preserves, rural resorts, those were integral to some maintaining that cultural heritage of the South and, and feeling, making someplace like Chicago feel like home to generation after generation, right? Um, Professor Joseph, I think we have about 10 minutes left. Should we talk more about DuSable uh, and, and the park and laying claim to space and how that so, I mean, we could, we could spend like all day talking about this stuff, but I feel then, like we should bring it up and root it in the, the present day, right? Because these are live issues for everyone now. Absolutely. And so seeing how that history then continues and how the DuSable name, again, represents a way for Black people to not only lay claim to space, but then to make it a visible space for other Black people who are coming to then say, this is a safe space, this is a space that's for you. Um, and so that's the other cool part about the name. So as I was saying earlier, we see in all of these lovely photographs um, that Professor McCammick was showing us how the black population in Chicago grows um, through the 1910 to 1970 period. And then there's because of deindustrialization and other factors kind of a stop. Um, historians kind of looked at as like the, the stop point of when African Americans are coming to Chicago and other northern and western city in droves. What my work does is say that in response to the change in immigration policy in the late 1960s with the Hart Seller Act ending national quotas, you then see a flood of 
um, Latin American, um, African from the continent and people from various Caribbean islands coming to similar places with a similar rhetoric that drove people for the great migration, which is better opportunities for education and work and, you know, safety, et cetera, et cetera. So as that is happening, we then see the mantle picked up by those folks to again lay claim to the space and they look to DuSable again as a person who represents Black belonging in Chicago, especially Haitian people who start to come to Chicago more and more. Um, really, we have trickling in, in the in the 40s and the 50s, and they're intermingling and living in the Black Belt and on the South Side and the typical Black areas that we were talking about. Um, but then they really start to come in the 70s, 80s, 90s into today. And one area then that has become a place for their activism, but again, black activism um, across black people in Chicago has been the work around the DuSable Park. I hit the wrong button, um, hitting the wrong button again. Sorry, here we go. So um, a son of Chicago, one of the most famous people, um, black, people, Black politicians in Chicago, is Harold Washington, um, the first Black mayor of, of Chicago who was elected in 1983. And one of the things that he does before his untimely death, right, as he is going to his second term, is he, he lays claim. He lays claim to this 3.1 acre plot of land right here at the end of the Riverwalk, Chicago Riverwalk, and to where Lake Michigan's going to meet. Um, this is what's actually now known as DuSable Harbor. That's another thing that has now been named. But in the 80s, um, Mayor Hill Washington dedicates this prime spot of waterway access and nature to DuSable. He says, we will construct a park dedicated to his legacy and his importance in the city. Well, we still don't have a park. We're closer to a park than we've been, but there has been a great deal of um, difficulty in getting the park constructed, which is tied to the legacy of these very intense racial issues that are, you know, causing African Americans to have to try to lay claim for themselves and lay the space for themselves in the 19 teens, 1920s, 1930s. We see that same thing happening again in the, the struggle for DuSable Park. So um, one of the things that occurs is that we find out that a company had been um, dumping radioactive materials into the park in the early 2000s, which makes that an uninhabitable space for people, but especially if it's an uninhabitable space that you're trying to bring more people of color to claim um, a history of, of Blackness in the city that's definitely not safe space, but goes into racial environmental issues that continue to happen in the city. And then while other parks have been built um, over the last 30, 35 years, there has not been um, an effort on Chicago to um, put part of their budget to the construction of the park until just this year um, that they have decided, I'm sorry, last year, there has been movement and they've decided to dedicate some money to seeing this park constructed. More recently, they have you know, done the cleaning up of the land so that it is no longer an environmental threat. Um, and there is a construction company, um, uh, they're more than a construction company, but um, construction firm um, related Midwest who has also dedicated $10 million to not only build the Dusable Park, but also to build a structure as well, either a hotel or a residence in this area. And so there's a lot still of contention around that issue with people who live in the area and how that will look and what that will do to change the landscape. But there's also a lot of discussion amongst residents as who is going to be coming to this park? Who are the visitors? How will they be accessing the park? Which again speaks to the issues of race and how. Um, they complicate the landscape and who has access to nature and who doesn't. This is a very wealthy area, okay? So there's not a ton of African Americans who have ever been to this part of the city, let alone would know that there was a park even coming there. So if we're thinking about bringing people into the space, there's a lot of questions on 
you know, surveillance and vulnerability. And we definitely don't want to see, um, you know, any violence in that area since it's supposed to be a space that is named and dedicated by and for Black people in the city. So this is still something to keep an eye out on as we're thinking about um, this larger conversation of Black people and claiming space and nature in particular in the city of Chicago. And maybe that's a good place to tee up a discussion of the Obama Presidential Center uh, in Jackson Park, which we can talk about a little bit. Uh, we were joking beforehand that this almost inevitably comes up in the Q&A. So if anybody has a specific question about our thoughts on the Obama Presidential Center that we don't address uh, in the next moment or two, please feel free to ask us. Um, although I, I, saying that, I usually try to avoid the question, um, but I'm going to try a different strategy today and just address it head on. Um, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, this fight over the Obama Presidential Center has been dragging out for about five years now um, since uh, President Obama announced that he had chosen uh, the Obama Foundation had chosen uh, Jackson Park, a strip of land uh, just east of Stony Island Avenue uh, and, and very near where the Midway Plaisance connects to Jackson Park as the site for his uh, presidential center. Um, and it's been uh, a five years rife with controversy and legal challenges. Um, I think it's, it's, it's incredibly significant to think about uh, the nation's first black president having his presidential center in a place in Jackson Park, which is now also, I think, considered uh, largely African-American space, laying claim to that space. So Washington Park becomes a black space by about 1930. Jackson Park is contested for, for many more decades. Uh, and I, it, it's still a racially integrated space, right? It's not uh, as exclusively African-American as Washington Park. Uh, and the Jackson Park Beach has a lot to do with that. Yeah as do the, the birding opportunities and all kinds of stuff in Jackson Park. Um, but it's become contentious uh, in part because Obama's uh, private foundation uh, is, is taking public land, right? It's, it's not a public uh, presidential library. It's, it's a presidential center that's right. part of the foundation. So it's a, it's a transfer of open space to private hands. Um, and, uh, also, most of the controversy uh, has centered not just around the open lands uh, taking, right, uh, which has gotten the backs up of a lot of environmentalists, a lot of historic preservationists that don't like to see this historic Olmsted and Vox landscape changed. Uh, although a lot of the footprint of the Obama Presidential Center is currently an athletic field and track, so um, it's not like we're we're getting rid of uh, sort of pristine uh, natural landscaping or anything. Um, a lot of it has, has been concerns over gentrification and the lack of a community benefits agreement guaranteeing affordable housing and jobs to the overwhelmingly uh, African-American neighborhoods of Woodlawn and West Woodlawn um, on the South Side and how, concerns about how that neighborhood's gonna change, right? Um, so similar issues to what Professor Joseph was talking about with DeSable Park right in the heart of the city playing out on the South Side, right? How is this historically African-American neighborhood going to change with a destination, not just for African-Americans, but for all Americans and international travelers, right? Uh, potentially profound changes for the landscapes and the neighborhoods that African-Americans have laid claim to for generations now. Um, so there's a lot of controversy there. And interestingly enough, uh, my current research, uh, a part of the story of uh, this, this, my next book that uh, Cheryl mentioned at the outset here about how the environmental movement really fails to build an interracial coalition in the 1970s, a part of that story has to do with the building of Diet High School at the north end of Washington Park, which opens in 1972, the very same year that DeSable Museum of African American History opens uh, on the east side of the park. So really laying claim to this space as African-American space, because we're talking about a period in the 70s, not that different than today, where Chicago public schools are incredibly segregated. Literally every student who was going to die at high school when it opened in the 70s was African-American. Um, battles between African-Americans who wanted schools, wanted equal opportunity, and wanted to see that space, that historic Olmsted and Vox landscape changed, 
battles with environmentalists who are trying to preserve open space. Those environmentalists, largely white middle-class Chicagoans who are increasingly decamping to the suburbs. You see almost the same battle lines over the Obama Presidential Center in 2020, here it is, in 2021. Here it is 50 years later, and we've still got groups like Protect Our Parks who have fought tenaciously, like legal battles, trying to, to scuttle the Obama Presidential Center just like they drove away George Lucas in the Lucas Museum along the lakefront. And what's that? What's that? I didn't know that. Yeah, so the I'll, just just as soon as they killed the Lucas Museum, uh, the opponents to taking uh, lakefront space for, for that, uh, like a month or two later, Obama announced the Presidential Center in Jackson Park, and they immediately turned their sights to fighting that instead. So you've got open land advocates, environmentalists fighting against uh, many African Americans. I would say the vast majority of African Americans on the South Side who, despite these concerns about a lack of a community benefits agreement, desperately want to see uh, the Obama Presidential Center built. And we're supposed to break ground this year, finally, after all the legal challenges. Um, but it, it's a replay of what was happening in the early 70s, this divide between white middle class environmentalists and, and black Chicagoans advocating for self-determination. And um, it's, it's crazy how history repeats itself. It's a total cliche, but we're seeing it all over again. Um, so we got, I think, 13 minutes yeah. for questions. Yes, we do. And um, I, I, I'm glad you did bring up the Obama um, issue. We're, we're working on a program on um, bringing in a few folks to talk about the Obama Presidential Library. And maybe we'll have you all come in as well. I think that would be an interesting conversation. <laughs> um, so. Um, I want to urge people to put questions into the Q&A. We have one question from Bob Joint. Um, and Dr. Joseph, I think you kind of touched on this, but maybe you could elaborate. Has there been a substantial migration from Haiti to Chicago? Yes. Um, so since um, the 1970s, there have been more and more, really since the, the, again, the trickle starts in the 40s and the 50s into the 60s, but that change in immigration policy and things like chain migration that is allowed in our immigration policy that you can send if you um, migrate, then you can send for family is a huge um, thing that shifts so much so that the largest um, non-white um, or the, the largest um, groups that are represented in non-native um, African-American born births in Chicago are Jamaican and Haitian. So there's a really um, growing Haitian population. Now the um, census and stuff, um, the data will tell you, you know, today maybe 20 to 30,000. But as we know, there are a lot of issues around census data and how people um, identify themselves versus what the census tells you to identify yourself as and multiple other issues and how comfortable people say, you know, immigration status, et cetera. Um, so community activists would put that number higher at about 100,000 people, um, mostly again on the South side, but then again, populating into other areas in the North and West um, and now into the South suburbs, which shows how um, gentrification of South, the South side part of the city that Brian, um, Professor McCann was talking a lot about also shapes where black immigrants live um, and their families as well. Um, I, I had a personal question that I wanted to ask. Um, so can both of you speak to um, what institutions, what organizations you tapped into for your primary source materials? You want me to take that first, Professor Joseph? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, so early 20th century is a little bit easier because there were fewer of them around. I think uh, primarily my source base um, from the Afri African-American community was from the Chicago Urban League. Uh, and there were also segregated divisions of groups like the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts who were uh, continuing to not just use city, the cities, um, the city centers like environmental resources, but go out to the forest preserves, 
go to even further flung locations. So the archival record there is pretty rich. Uh, the Chicago Defender, as Professor Joseph mentioned, and other African-American newspapers in the city are also really rich. And the digitization is a boon uh, to this sort of project. I mean, um, you know, I, I, the argument of my book is that nature wasn't at the margins of African-American life in Chicago. But it certainly was at the margins of the historiography, at the margins of the stories that were told about Black life in Chicago. And uh, it, it would be extremely hard to just go plow through decades worth of the Chicago Defender to find articles about how and why Washington Park mattered, how and why uh, African-American resorts in rural Michigan and downstate Illinois mattered without digitization and keyword searchability. Yes. Um, so that was an absolute boon. Um, and from the, the city's perspective, I used a lot of Chicago Park District uh, archival records, um, and I'll stop there. Professor Joseph, your, your source base is probably a little bit different looking mainly at the post-World War II era. Yeah, so the um, Chicago Defender was a huge and is still um, a huge um, resource for me. A shout out to the art, the digitization of that newspaper as well was extremely helpful. But my work is a lot about how um, typical archival spaces, so archival primary sources often write out and do not include the stories of black people. And so um, like there is no archival collection dedicated to Dusab. Um, we're not sure exactly if not, did he leave any behind and they were, you know, not kept or did he not leave any behind? So my work is really also um, largely about recovery through oral histories and oral traditions. And so um, I rely a lot upon, you know, how folks um, who wrote about the history of Chicago then interfaced and talked about and remembered Dusab, Black people, Indigenous people through oral traditions. And then um, to look at the Haitian community in Chicago, I then did 60 oral histories with Haitian people who have lived in Chicago over the last um, 40, 50, 60 years. And that um, archive is now becoming a digital archival collection with the Haitian American Museum of Chicago so that we do start to have, um, you know, an actual primary source archive for people who continue to want to study this work. So um, kind of piecing it together, which is um, both lovely and, and a lot of work, um, building your own archive while also researching and writing about it. But, you know, somebody's got to do it. So we have a, a question, um, very interesting presentation. Can you talk a bit about what resources are available to sustain and enhance park areas on the south side of Chicago? It seems that inequities exist with respect to current funding levels. Yeah, there's no question that there are inequities. Um, the park district denies it pretty vehemently, uh, but if you just go walking around Washington Park today, you see it in the landscape, right? Washington Park is not maintained like Lincoln Park is. It's no coincidence that Lincoln Park is used primarily by white Chicagoans on the north side. Washington Park is used primarily by African Americans on the south side. Now they're nations, right? I mean, they, these are still places where different communities are mixing and using the space in different ways. There is no doubt that there are inequalities. Uh, I'm just gonna drop, I think, panelists and attendees, a link in the, the chat here to a Friends of the Parks report from 2018, um, which uh, points out these inequalities uh, and, and pretty stridently alleges, uh, you know, uh, that the park district is not doing what it should be doing to ensure equality of access to all communities in Chicago. Um, and there's a long history of this, right? A long legal history of this. Chicago Park District had to enter into a consent decree in the 1980s when the Justice Department said, you're not giving equal access and equal opportunities to all Chicagoans. There are vast inequalities along lines of, of race. Uh, the Park District was released from that consent decree after uh, a few years, but those inequalities persist. And the, this Friends of the Parks report that I linked to is really pointing out those continued inequalities. So um, there are certainly many community groups on the south side and on the west side that are advocating for 
parks. I, I don't want to frame Friends of the Parks as the be all end all, but that's just the first thing that comes to my mind uh, when I when I think about this long historical trajectory of inequalities in the parks, and and they are probably the most vocal. Uh, and have the, the biggest media platform uh, in order to, to talk about those inequalities and challenge the park district on that stuff. I'll echo that. I've, um, they've also been um, largely involved in the advocacy work to see the DuSable Park built um, as well. So um, Juanita Irizara, Irizari is the, um, the head, the director at Friends of the Parks right now. And I know she thinks a lot about these inequities in space. Uh, another question, has there been any history done of Idlewild, the African-American resort near Baldwin, Michigan? Yes, that's in two chapters of my book. Please buy it. Uh, I'm just kidding. You can get it at the library. Libraries are great. Uh, but it is in my book and I'm building on the work of other historians. Um, if you go to Amazon uh, or don't go to Amazon, please. Pretend I didn't say that. Go to your independent booksellers. But uh, a couple of books that are, are directly about Idlewild and not about making the kinds of connections that I do between Chicagoans who are going to places like Washington Park and then summering at Idlewild uh, are a book by Ronald J. Stevens just titled Idlewild um, and another book by Lewis Walker titled Black Eden. Um, so there's a, a increasing body of historical scholarship on Idlewild and those kinds of African-American resorts that are absolutely linked to the great migration that we talked about, right? Some place like Idlewild does not exist as a center of uh, African-American wealth and recreation as a summer resort without the wealth that African-Americans were able to build in places like the South side of Chicago, right? Where they are building businesses um, and building wealth, building a city within a city really is what that book Black Metropolis is about, right? The, the Caton uh, book that, we, that I referenced the map of earlier. Um, so yes. The short answer is yes, there is a lot of scholarship on Idlewild and I do talk about it a bit in my book. A uh, question of what is the difference between the siting of the DuSable Museum in Public Park and the issues that surround the Obama Center? I will say really quickly, Professor Joseph, you probably have your own take on this, but uh, the, the DuSable Museum actually took over an abandoned park police building. So the Chicago Park District used to have their own police force. Mm -hmm. They folded that for financial reasons, I think, primarily. And the, the Chicago City Police now police the parks. Um, so that building had been in existence uh, very early on in Washington Park's history. It wasn't part of Olmsted and Vox's original design. But that building had been there for a long time and it was sitting there as unused space. Um, so when the DuSable takes over that space, it's really making that space productive for the black community. So I think the fact that you already have an extant structure there makes it pretty different. Agreed. And previously, um, the museum had been coming out of Margaret Burrow and her husband's home. That's where the original museum had been. So it was becoming very popular to the African-Americans in the area to be able to visit and learn about the history within the city, that then when they moved it to a larger building, it was seen as a, as a welcome thing since it was um, already in a space um, and already in existed and could then address the needs of the community. I think the issue that's different with today is what Professor McCammick was talking about, that if you ask African Americans in the area, you know, whether they, with the critiques they have, they're still largely in support of seeing that in the space. And it's not them necessarily leading the charge of saying that, you know, there are issues with having the Obama Museum there because it, to them, again, it could be, and I don't want to speak for them, but from what I'm understanding this is still a positive in the way that having the DuSable Museum was a positive thing that is about Black people claiming, you know, laying claim to their history and their space. It's other folks that are coming inside um, who maybe are not as connected with the community's needs who are driving a lot of the critique and lawsuits, et cetera. We have one, uh, one final question and then there's a, a comment I'd like to get to. Um, the question is, would the South Side opposite Washington Park have been a better place for the Obama Center? Well, Barack Obama didn't think so. So who am I to say? 
That, that was the other finalist, though. Uh, if you have been, uh, if you have followed this, there was another site proposal on the west side of Washington Park that would have taken a little sliver of land, less than they took out of Jackson Park, as well as land uh, outside of the park, just west of Washington Park, that the University of Chicago had acquired for just that purpose, or, or maybe they had had it for a while. Um, Obama decided not ultimately to go with that. I, you know, I think that my understanding of it is that it had to do with proximity to the lakefront, which as we know is just central in the, the minds of, of Chicagoans, uh, and proximity to the transportation and the Museum of Science and Industry, other destinations that are more well established in Chicago's sort of tourist uh, you know, world. Washington Park, a couple miles to the west, is really even more so in the heart of the Black Belt still, right? Um, so I think in many ways it would have been better. In, in many ways, it makes sense why Obama picked Jackson Park instead. I think, I think he probably set himself up for more of a fight in Jackson Park, honestly, over the, the open space. Um, he's but, used to fighting though, you know, this yep. guy, he's used to the struggles, so. That's right. <laughs> um, we, we have a comment uh, from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Rebecca Sive. Um, letting you know that Dr. Burroughs and I were appointed to the Chicago Park District Board of Commissioners by Mayor Washington. While there together, we addressed many issues related to race and the Chicago landscape, including lawsuits alleging discriminatory action by prior mayoral administrations, by CPD and allocation of pools, gyms, field houses, et cetera, in Chicago parks. The West Side parks are enormously important to understanding this issue of landscape and race in Chicago. I hope you will address in future presentations and I hope we will too. Um, I would love to have both of you back. This has been a, a great conversation. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Um, we also uh, appreciate you, our audience, our, your support of our uh, library programming and we look forward to seeing you all in our next program. Thank you to ULCC members and Caxton Club members for attending. And we look forward to seeing you in uh, at our next program, which by the way, here's a, a plug. Um, the outstanding, the ULCC Outstanding Book on the History of Chicago 2021 Book Award is uh, going to be held on Thursday, March 11th at six, at six o'clock. It's a virtual event. Um, I hope you'll all join us. So thank you so much to, to you both and um, we wish you a good afternoon. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Thank Thanks you. Thanks a lot, Cheryl, ULCC and Caxton Club. Appreciate thank it. Thank you all for having us. Thank you, Professor Joseph. It was a pleasure, Professor McKenna. It was a pleasure. <laughs> right. Thank Thanks, you. everyone.